let me start by saying that um, one of the greatest challenges through American history has been the management of capitalism. We began our national history as a revolt against excessive governmental control of the economy, taxes and controls that led to the Boston Tea Party and to similar revolts uh, prior to the revolution and eventually the war for independence um, that uh, gave rise to our new nation. Laissez-faire has been part of the American DNA from the very beginning. Before and throughout the 19th century, government's role was either to stay at a distance from private enterprise or to promote it, but rarely to regulate it. We were a country characterized by smallholder agriculture, except in the plantation economy of the slaveholding South, and the nascent industrialization in the years following Reconstruction, particularly in the Northeast. In the last decade of the 19th century, we were very rapidly becoming the industrial behemoth of the world. We accounted in the 1890s for one third of global industrial output. And this brought about a rapid movement of labor from the farms to the factories to the cities, as well as massive immigration. It was a period of dramatic change with some of the following characteristics. The Gilded Age was a period of immense private fortune being amassed by the so-called robber barons, the titans of the Industrial Revolution. Increasing concentration of capitalism in monopolies was another characteristic, the trusts. And I'm talking about Standard Oil Company of John D. Rockefeller or the Northern Securities Company of J.P. Morgan. In contrast, an urban workforce was living in decrepit tenement housing and working long hours in unsafe and unsanitary conditions. And this included child labor, the face of the industrial behemoths. In short, this was a period of massive disparities in income and wealth. The 1890 census showed that 9% of the population controlled 71% of the wealth in the country. And by 1900, interestingly, in contrast to that, about three quarters of the American population, according to the census, qualified as poor. There was tremendous corruption in our government, particularly in the urban machine politics and the spoil system of bribery and graft as, uh, as urban machine politics and urban political bosses gained, gained control. And there was growing restiveness among the politically excluded, especially women. There was plenty of violence during this period, especially labor unrest that turned into pitched battles between workers and armed troops the Carnegie Steel strike, uh, the Pullman Company strike, and the Ludlow Massacre in Colorado. This is a, a, a newspaper story about the, uh, about the, the Ludlow Massacre. And I, I have to say that um, as, a, as a former employee of the Rockefeller Foundation, one of the thing I, things I learned is that uh, the Carnegie Corporation and the Rockefeller Foundation were the direct outgrowth of the responses of these robber barons to the political unrest that they were seeing increasingly in the form of the Carnegie strike, uh, the Ludlow massacre, and similar kinds of, of events. Also going on during this time was an was a, a unprecedented despoliation of the natural environment. Logging, mining, were destroying large tracts of land. And we'll come back to that question. Uh, there was a lack of sanitary standards in food processing and in waste disposal with very high resulting morbidity and mortality, particularly in the cities, in the overcrowded, slum-ridden cities. And finally, I would mention among the characteristics of the era, 
uh, was the growth of a jingoistic nationalism uh, manifested in the idea of the two ocean navy when the United States flexing its muscle decided to take on Britannia's rule of the seas. Uh, we saw the Spanish-American War uh, break out during that period and, and, and uh, 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 an attitude of unrivaled American military power uh, and imperialistic ambition leading to our only colony in the Philippines and the conquest of Puerto Rico and, and taking that away from Spain at the same time. Well, this rapid American industrialization had generated substantial economic growth through the latter half of the, of the 19th century, and that in turn fostered the creation of, of this vast new wealth. The Republican Party, as the champion of this development, enjoyed a dominant position in American politics, as can be seen by the fact that in the 40 years between 1861 and 1901, Republicans controlled the Senate for all but four of those 40 years, and those four were not consecutive. It was two two-year periods during which the Republicans um, did not con uh, control the U.S. Senate. But the party was beginning to falter uh, at century's end as it failed to address the attendant problems of the industrial era, predatory monopolies, abuse of the working classes, fraud and malpractice in the distribution of foods and medicines, an increasing unrest, as, as, as uh, increasing unrest, uh, as manifested by such events as the Haymarket riot in 1886 had demonstrated, a new turn was necessary. But any suggestion of one antagonized entrenched interests, many within the Republican Party itself. These included industrial plutocrats, their cronies among the urban political bosses, and allied members of Congress. A potent political clash was probably inevitable. Even by the 1880s, a populist movement was growing across the country. One could date the beginning of the progressive movement from the passage, perhaps, in, 19, uh, in, in 1890 by Congress of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was a direct response to pressure that was growing on the Republican Party uh, from prairie populists such as William Jennings Bryan uh, and Republican progressives who were emerging at that time such as Robert La Follette of Wisconsin who wanted to rein in the marauding capitalism of the robber barons. Public outrage at the plight of the working classes was fanned by the muckrakers, uh, most notably by Ida Tarbell, Lincoln Steffens, Jacob Rees, Upton Sinclair, and the publisher S.S. McClure and his McClure's Weekly. Let me go back. That's uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, an expose of the uh, meatpacking industry in Chicago. Jacob Rees, How the Other Half Lives, uh, an expose of tenement housing and its uh, conditions in New York City and that was McClure's Magazine, which reigned supreme during that period. Progressivism really grew out of that dismay and a desire to fix what many saw as a broken system. William McKinley, who was elected president in 1896, was a conservative. He was closely allied with and beholden to the East Coast Republican establishment and its scion, Senator Nelson Aldridge of Rhode Island, who was the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, who also happened to be a very close friend of John D. Rockefeller, who was the father-in-law of uh, Rockefeller's um, son's wife, Abby, and the maternal grandfather of Nelson Rockefeller. There was a very, very close connection between Aldridge and the Eastern Establishment and the robber barons. McKinley also had a reluctant vice president, a war hero named Theodore Roosevelt, who had risen to prominence as a reformer when he was police commissioner in New York City and following his exploits in the Spanish-American War in Cuba uh, as governor of New York State. Uh, they chose Roosevelt as vice president because they didn't like his politics and they wanted to get him 
out of the out of the way, and so where better a place to stash him than the vice presidency? <clears throat> and he was very reluctant to take that position, but he did. Um, and of course, suddenly and unexpectedly, he became president in September 1901, when McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist only six months into his second term. Although few anticipated it at the time, McKinley's assassination opened the way for the federal government to enter one of the most eventful and consequential periods in American history, the Progressive Era. That's Teddy when he was New York State Governor. <clears throat> of course, the previous picture was the famous Rough Rider. So, turning to Roosevelt and the Progressive Era, as president, Theodore Roosevelt had to deal with the dominant conservatism of his party and a Congress that was hostile to reform. He took the reins of the presidency without much more of a plan than to emulate the wisdom uh, and, uh, of Abraham Lincoln and his ability to unite the nation. Roosevelt had the ambition to bring the nation together in the way that he believed Lincoln had done uh, in, in, uh, at the time of the Civil War. But legislation required cooperation with Congress, and that was not readily won. Roosevelt's legislative victories were modest, but they were historic. A railroad regulation bill that, that really broke the, the, the hold of some of the trusts over, uh, over transportation uh, and allowed for competition within the industry a Meat Inspection Act, a Pure Food and Drug Act, which led to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, established federal responsibility for inspecting products that protect consumers. Roosevelt had better success using his presidency as a bully pulpit, a term he uh, coined uh, and lived by through, throughout his political life. He popularized reform among voters. He convinced a generation of Americans that government should be responsive to injustice. When he grew impatient with the executive legislative give and take, he took bold executive action that did not require legislative cooperation. Most notably, he instructed his Justice Department to prosecute J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Trust, a holding company, charging it with monopolistic practices, and he won the case and became known forever after as the trust buster. He didn't bust that many trusts, but uh, the fact that he was successful in that one uh, gave him uh, a, uh, a tremendous political boost. He also made labor history. Although previous strikes had usually prompted presidents to side with management by sending federal troops to suppress strikers, as in the anthrop anthracite coal strike, Roosevelt pressed management to negotiate with labor. He also used executive orders to protect forests and wildlife, the Grand Canyon, and other natural wonders and historic sites, and thereby cementing his reputation as the greatest conservationist president in our history. Roosevelt deployed federal power on behalf of national goals, far beyond anything seen since the Civil War. But two realities surrounding the Roosevelt presidency merit particular attention. First, the Rough Rider president, in bringing progressive precepts into the national government, stopped short of the kinds of redistributive economic policies favored by more radical progressives of that era. His aim was to level the playing field by outlawing practices and privileges that allowed favored groups to thrive at the expense of ordinary citizens. He didn't embrace the goal of a graduated income tax, for example. After two terms, Roosevelt turned his office over to his close friend and ally, William Howard Taft. Taft and Roosevelt had grown up in politics together and they held very similar views. Both understood the imperatives of progressivism and helped move the Republican Party in the direction of reform. But they did so out of a conviction that failure to reform 
would result in increasing violence in a country being torn apart by wealth disparity and class antagonisms. In other words, as his cousin Franklin did 25 years later, TR understood that reform was the vastly preferred alternative to civil war. While Roosevelt and Taft shared a political philosophy, their personalities could not have been more different. Roosevelt was wildly extroverted, egotistical and impulsive in style, while Taft was more of an introvert, careful, judicious in his approach to all things. During the Taft administration from 1909 to 1913, much additional progressive legislation was enacted and the ground was laid for the passage in 1913 of the 16th Amendment, which established the progressive income tax. According to his biographers, most famously Doris Kearns Goodwin in her highly acclaimed book, The Bully Pulpit, uh, Roosevelt and Taft's estrangement during the Taft presidency arose not so much from policy differences as from Roosevelt's resentment that he was no longer the president. <laughs> he deeply regretted his pledge to serve no more than two terms and could never rec reconcile himself to another man's being in charge. <laughs> this egomania drove Roosevelt to ultimately destroy Taft's presidency by splitting the Republican Party with his bull moose insurgency in 1912. And Woodrow Wilson subsequently was elected president, breaking a long string of Republican presidencies. Interestingly, the Democrats had always been more fervent progressives than the Republicans. And so when Wilson moved into the White House, the pace of reform actually quickened including the swift passage of the income tax uh, amendment that I mentioned a moment ago, the, the, the basis for which had been set and established in the, in the Taft presidency, but was actually enacted uh, once Wilson uh, and the Democrats had gained firmer control <clears throat> of the levers of power. Uh, they went on uh, in 1920 to uh, pass both the 18th Amendment, establishing prohibition, which was a favorite topic of many within the progressive movement, and of course, the women's vote in 1920 uh, with, with, through the, uh, the 19th Amendment, which was another long-held progressive goal, which finally was enacted uh, in 1920. It's hard to believe from this perspective that uh, it's only 100 years ago that women got the vote. It, it's still just hard for me to wrap my head around that. The progressive era came to an end with the election of Warren Harding, the unfortunate Warren Harding. By November 1920, America was exhausted after 20 years of determined and often overbearingly self-righteous reformism. And it was ready for a less activist government, which in turn ushered in the roaring 20s and the headlong rush back to laissez-faire capitalism. The lawlessness that followed was spawned by prohibition, and that characterized a tumultuous decade <clears throat> immediately following the end of the progressive era. Teddy Roosevelt was a complex man of contradictions. I've spoken mostly about his virtues, of which there were many. But he had some blemishes, too, particularly when seen from the vantage point of the 21st century. I've already mentioned his vanity and his ego. He was also a bigot and a racist. He showed little interest in improving race relations in the United States, even at a time when Jim Crow was at its height. And he was a eugenicist, not uncommon among his social and intellectual peers of the day. Roosevelt had little patience with the details of policy or with the legislative process and probably could have achieved even more extensive and more lasting change had he been able to discipline himself better in working with Congress. And he was an unabashed imperialist, determined to project American power around the globe, <clears throat> often at the expense of people living in other lands like the Philippines that had been subjugated by the United States. Well, let me talk a little bit then 
about the parallels between the progressive era and today. <clears throat> Why did I choose as the title of my talk, Where is Teddy Roosevelt When We Need Him? It was because I see some uh, uh, striking parallels between then and now. First, today we are in the midst of an historic economic transition from the industrial to the post-industrial era, from manufacturing to services, from lifetime employment with a single employer to the gig economy. This bears many similarities to the late 19th century transition from an agrarian rural economy and society to an urban industrial one. In both cases, there have been jarring dislocations and nearly unprecedented inequality in the accumulation of wealth. And economic and social dislocations are frequently accompanied by populism. The populism that gave rise to the progressive era was born out of rural resentments at the growing power of an urban elite. The, the impoverishment and abuse of, new, of a new urban proletariat, the exclusion particularly of women from political participation, widespread anger over economic, social, and political inequities resulting in low wages and increasing poverty, poor sanitation, unsafe food, low levels of educational opportunity, polluted air and water, and rising levels of sickness and death. The importance of Theodore Roosevelt was that he used the unique power and authority of the presidency to craft a constructive, progressive response to these ills. He used his bully pulpit to, to rally the country to respond with such important measures as breaking up the monopolies, thus reducing but not destroying the power of great wealth, encouraging the development of free universal primary and secondary education, using federal authority to expand public health and regulate the food and drug industries, and creating agencies to support organized labor and regulate the financial and manufacturing industries. In other words, he turned widespread anger and resentment into a potent force for reform, and like other presidents in times of national crisis, Lincoln and FDR come to mind, he was prepared to use executive power up to and perhaps beyond the limits foreseen or intended by the Founding Fathers. He was able to find a way to move the reactionary and hidebound Republican Party of his time from its posture of protector of entrenched interests and the status quo to a constructive force for change. Roosevelt was no revolutionary. Indeed, in some important respects, he was what I call a pro progressive conservative. Understanding the imperative to respond to the overwhelming populist demand for change by using the system to achieve it lest it be overthrown. In this respect, as I've already mentioned, he foreshadowed the response of his cousin Franklin to the equally great imperative for change represented by the Great Depression. Both were determined to save the system in the face of threats that they thought might very well bring it down. So what are we to make of all of this from the vantage point of America a fifth of the way into the 21st century? I believe that we're seeing two great populisms competing with one another today. Both are responses to the great dislocations of our current economic and social transition. The first is on the right, where Tea Party reactionaries, social conservatives, and white nationalists are determined to take America back to some mythical version of the past that they see as far better than the present, and who are determined to hold back changes that are threatening their way of life. On the left is a populism incubated in growing anger and resentment at economic inequality, social exclusion, and political corruption. A populism that finds expression in identity politics among ethnic and racial groups that feel left out and left behind, a rising demand for economic policies that redistribute wealth more equitably, and political reforms that respond to the injustice of rampant gerrymandering and the overwhelming influence of big money in politics. 
The two populisms have brought us to a moment of political gridlock and apparent intransigence. Our two major parties are at loggerheads and seem incapable of agreeing even on the terms of the debate. The populace is similarly divided. Unlike the crisis of 1929 to 32, the present situation looks more to me like the situation around 1900 when the economy was strong, even stronger in some respects than it is today, but we could not agree on how or even whether to share that prosperity. That's what I meant in my opening statement, that one of the greatest challenges through American history has been the management of capitalism. If all this sounds familiar, it's because we have seen one version or another of this play before. Mark Twain is reputed to have said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. <laughs> what the progressive era shows is that at an earlier moment of great stress and danger, our system was able to respond creatively and constructively to bring about a fairer, safer, and more equitable era than any that had preceded it. Then, after we'd fallen back into old and bad habits, it happened again during a period of possibly even greater peril only 20 years later. And now, after a comparatively tranquil interlude of some 70 years, we are once again at a crossroads. Theodore Roosevelt emerged during the chaos of turn of the century populism as a leader who discovered a way out of the conflict and confusion and led the country through it. The Republican Party is even more moribund in 2019 than it was in 1901, but still, but does it still have within it an individual or a small, small group of individuals who could do what Teddy did? Or alternatively, is this transformative figure to be found in the Democratic Party, which today appears to be too preoccupied, too preoccupied with its internecine conflicts to present a coherent and compelling path forward? Or is she somewhere outside the party structure altogether? Of course, I don't know. <laughs> we saw in the progressive era serious efforts to diminish the worst effects of rising inequality, and some efforts, such as the progressive income tax, to address root causes. So anticipating to a degree the great GMAL debate next week, I believe that our society has the resilience to work its way out of our present quandary. Whether our political system as presently constructed will provide the platform for such a revival, or some new structure of revolving our differences might evolve, is anyone's guess. But I think that over the past nearly 250 years, the American experiment has proven itself to be resilient and enduring. Thank you. So, we have uh, quite a lot of time <laughs> for um, for questions and comment, and uh, we don't have to hang around until seven o'clock if uh, the spirit doesn't move us to do so, but who would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment? Comment. Is this a let us pray time? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a comment, yes. <laughs> Let me repeat the question. The, uh, the question was, um, in the progressive era, uh, the regulatory regime that was put in place was responding to a, uh, a self-contained American economy. Uh, it didn't uh, really have to worry about um, institutions beyond the reach of, of of our own government or governments. Uh, in, the, in the contemporary era uh, of globalization uh, and multinational corporations, do we have uh, within our control the same kind of regulatory capacity uh, 
uh, to solve the problems of international capitalism uh, as, we, as we see them. Is that a fair? Well, well brief. Right, so um, I, I'm prepared to, for, the, uh, for that question because <laughs> Uh, it came to me by email a couple of days ago, uh, and, I've been think and, I've been, and I've been thinking about it uh, since that time. Um, I think that, that, the, that, that, the, um, that the, most, the direct answer is no. Uh, obviously, with, um, with, multinational, with a multinational corporation, with uh, international supply chains, with no product of any consequence that is made, uh, in, in a single country with uh, the, the, the enormous uh, kind of interlocking nature of, uh, of contemporary international uh, capitalism and, 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 the, uh, and globalization, I don't think we have it within our power to regulate to the point that the progressives did uh, in, in their era or, or to bring about the kinds of reforms uh, in the behavior of the capitalist system that they were able to accomplish. That said, I do think that um, the that 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 such regulatory uh, control um, could be imagined uh, through a uh, a system of international cooperation, uh, through international um, mechanisms that didn't exist uh, in the progressive era, like. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the World Trade Organization and various uh, UN organizations, international banking institutions, and so on, um, and uh, a concerted and effective international diplomatic effort that brought at least the principal industrial powers together uh, in a unified way to try to bring that about. That would require uh, a degree of diplomatic skill that is certainly not, lack, not, not present at the moment. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine the United States, uh, or in fact any other uh, leading economy, leading such an effort. Um, it would not have been unimaginable 10 years ago. Uh, and I think it is possible to imagine uh, that with certain kinds of political changes in this country, we could once again uh, assume a position of, of, of leadership of that kind. But I'd say it's a long shot. Uh, and um, I can't say that I'm sanguine that this would be possible. But the, but the short answer to your question is we can't do it alone. It could only be done through international cooperation. And uh, I don't see us being in a position to lead anything like that now. It, uh, it was the questioner's understanding that in Roosevelt's time, he was very successful in getting the media behind him and using the media uh, to get his messages across. Uh, how does that compare with the, with the current situation, with the, with the present situation? Um, well, I, I, well, I think Roosevelt was a, was a, was a spectacularly successful communicator. Um, he, uh, he did not have an entirely unified uh, media. Uh, the, the, there was a fractiousness in, in, the, uh, in the newspaper industry uh, back in the, in the progressive years and a tremendous uh, uh, set of battles going on between the Hearst papers and uh, other media outlets. Uh, so that I, I don't think, that, I think that, that Roosevelt was successful in using the press to get his message out. Uh, but I think it's wrong to say that the, that the press was kind of unified behind Roosevelt in, in that respect. Uh, so how does that compare uh, with the moment? Um, I have to say that I think that the present incumbent of the White House is also a spectacularly successful manipulator of, of the media. Um, I think one of the secrets of his political success is that he has been so successful um, in, 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 in media manipulation. Uh, we also have a, a fractiousness within the media with uh, uh, as, as deep divisions or deeper divisions as existed at, at that time. Um, so while Roosevelt, uh, as I tried to say in my, in my uh, remarks, was a very effective communicator 
of a unifying and progressive and reform agenda, the equally effective use of the bully pulpit by the present incumbent is exactly the opposite of that, in my opinion. Back there. I wonder if, if maybe you want to re retitle uh, he's no Teddy Roosevelt. But one of the, one of the more interesting parallels that I found in, in what you were describing is you had a Republican Party in the 1890s that had somebody who was, I think, reasonably described as a rogue member of that party who ultimately ascended to the presidency. And if I think back to 2015-16, we saw that again a little over 100 years later in the midst of turmoil, which was very similar to what we saw in Roosevelt's time. The difference, of course, is once he ascended to the presidency, what, what he's done uh, versus what, what Roosevelt did, trying to uh, take the progressive steps versus actively resist the progressive steps, if you will. And I'm wondering uh, if you have a view as to why uh, it's so much more difficult 120 years later to try to move forward uh, in a progressive manner without the result feeling to the Republican Party like they've moved so far to the left that it's just not possible. I think everybody did hear that question, right? Um, and uh, I'm sorry you all heard it because <laughs> I don't know how to answer it. Uh, it, it, it it's a, uh, no, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, uh, Ro Roosevelt was able to become a reformer within a Republican party that I think would not have stood for a reform agenda coming from the other party. And I think that's the difference. I think that uh, uh, Roosevelt was a reformer from within. Uh, he had to defeat some of the most hidebound of the conservatives within the Republican Party, but he was able to mobilize within the Republican Party uh, a reform movement that eventually was, was, was successful. Uh, when you have the two political parties as estranged from one another as they are today, it seems to me that um, the best chance for finding a way out of our current morass is not for the Democrats to win the next election, which you know, perhaps they will, but I think the stalemate will likely continue if, if they do. I think it would be for a reform movement to grow within the Republican Party, as long as the Republicans hold the White House, the challenge is the orthodoxy of the moment. Uh, and uh, that seems like a very, very remote possibility to me at the moment. I mean, I think that's what John McCain stood for uh, and a few others in the Republican Party, but it, it is the, the failure of traditional Republicans, Republicans who believed in small government and fiscal responsibility and a strong defense to to reestablish uh, a, a, a base within the Republican Party that begins to pull it back from the Tea Party and white nationalist right that has completely captured it, and captured Trump, by the way, as well. Uh, so I, I um, you know, as, as, it, as it took Nixon to go to China and, and open China, it kind of, it, it, it takes somebody with a reformist orientation within the conservative movement to, to, to make this happen. Um, the alternative is something like what happened in 1932, uh, and that would be for there be, to be such revulsion uh, at what is going on in Republican governance that the Democrats capture control of all three houses and, uh, and, and you have, in, a, in effect, an electoral revolution. Uh, I don't think uh, that at the moment there's an FDR on the horizon to lead that within the Democratic Party, but I don't put it out of the realm of possibility either. Uh, the question was whether, um, the, the, uh, after uh, saying that uh, Roosevelt came from a family tradition of philanthropy, uh, of, of kind of enlightened conservatism. Uh, 
um, understanding that it was the responsibility of the wealthy uh, to share their wealth in ways that uh, worked to the benefit of a much larger part of society. Um, couldn't there be within the Republican Party today uh, a philanthropic impulse among the wealthy that was comparable to that? Is, is that yes. a, a fair, yeah. And, um, I, uh, maybe, but I don't, I don't see it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, was, it, was this, it was the instinct for self-preservation that led Andrew Carnegie to build libraries all over this country. Uh, he, and he, he wrote a, a famous essay, um, and it, somebody helped me with the, it, the something of wealth. The, uh, but it, it, was, it was about why people who had prospered and, and been fortunate and had, had fortune smile upon them had a responsibility to society as a whole to share their good fortune uh, with the less fortunate. The robber barons uh, came around to an understanding that um, this was not only um, uh, perhaps the right thing to do, and, and of course they had the luxury that they could do pretty much anything they wanted uh, with the amount of wealth that they had accumulated, but that it was good politics, and it was in fact self-preservation. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt uh, made league with the Carnegies and the Rockefellers also at that time, uh, in, in, in sharing their philanthropic impulse. But he felt that private capital by itself was not sufficient and that, and that the public sector really needed to play a much more active role in addressing the issues of inequity. Uh, and what made Roosevelt different from his father was that he didn't just think that the family owed it to people of New York to do more on their behalf in, in, in relatively limited ways. He felt it was really the responsibility of government to address deep inequities uh, in, in the society. Uh, the question was how I think Boris Johnson is gonna figure in with uh, <laughs> the, pray, the prayerfulness of, uh, um, uh, I assume that's more, more a comment than a question, Clarissa, because I, uh, I have no idea. But I, I, I think that uh, I've seen nothing in Boris Johnson's writings or his political behavior that gives me confidence that he's going to be a transformative figure of any kind. Uh, yeah, uh, the comment was that um, for Teddy Roosevelt, the job was easier than it would be for a reformist coming out of the current contemporary Republican Party in this country, which is intent on dismantling what's left of, uh, of, the, uh, of the progressive state. Um, and that, that is a point of view. Um, and I certainly didn't mean to suggest that I thought there is within the current Republican Party uh, an obvious figure who could emerge as Roosevelt did. But one way in which I think the current Republican Party is actually different from the Republican Party of the, uh, of the, of the late 19th and early 20th centuries is that that, that party um, was, it, it did have an ideology of fiscal conservatism uh, and supporting um, the, the growth of, of, of industrial America. I mean, it, 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 it was not progressive, uh, but it did have a set of beliefs uh, and, 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 a, and a core ideology that I think is lacking today. Uh, I don't think there is a core ideology today. I mean, when, when, when I talk to, to Ralph Colin about uh, today's Republican Party, he despairs of the fact that there, that, that there is nothing recognizable in the Republican Party that that, that he once knew. And so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not actually optimistic that, uh, that the next Teddy Roosevelt can come out of the present Republican Party, uh, which is why I said, well, maybe she'll come out of some other place uh, or, or, or possibly uh, somebody will emerge from within the Democratic Party with, with a unifying message. I mean, what, what, what really, what Roosevelt did that seems so hard now to imagine is to unify the country around a set of ideals uh, and, and a set of objectives. Uh, he had a strong economy uh, to, to, to which to, to attach that, uh, that agenda. Um, but the bully pulpit, um, and, I, and I mentioned that he didn't do all that much legislatively. What he did do uh, 
was unify the country around a way of addressing the, the, the fundamental issues of inequality and, and, and inequity. Uh, and he could get both political parties uh, to, a, to, to some degree to get behind that. that. That unifying agenda and unifying message is what we seem today to be despairing uh, in, its, in its absence. Um, and um, I don't know, I mean, I'd be really interested if there's anybody here uh, who sees uh, a ray of hope, uh, uh, a diamond in the rough someplace. You answered your question, uh, actually. He, he said, he said uh, if, if the two political parties today are both incapable of producing that kind of leadership, how about a third party? Uh, and, and what would I say about the role of the Bull Moose Party as a third party uh, in that context? Well, I think, as I said to him, that an he answered his own question. I, third parties in American politics don't work. Uh, they never have. Uh, well, I shouldn't say they never have, but they haven't in the last two centuries. Um, and, and, and the reason is that our current electoral system so uh, militates against uh, a, a, a third party being successful that I just can't see it emerging. Um, it, 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 it's possible to imagine um, an individual arising out of a third party uh, who sufficiently captures the public imagination that he gets embraced by one of the existing political parties, or she, uh, and, and, and becomes a, a, a national leader. It's hard for me to see a third party really effectively challenging either of the, of the two existing parties. I mean, Mike Bloomberg looked into that question uh, in some detail. Could I run a third party or should I run for president under one of the two existing parties? And he came to the conclusion that neither strategy could be successful, even for a multi-billionaire. Uh, so I, um, uh, I, I just don't see the third party as being a way out, unless uh, Derek succeeds in changing the Constitution of the United States so that we move to a different kind of electoral basis. The Bull Moose Party failed because it split the Republican Party and allowed the Democrats to win, just like uh, Ralph Nader did to the Democratic Party. I mean, the third, third, uh, third party candidacies tend to bring down uh, the, the, uh, the, the party from which they draw the largest support. And uh, Ross Perot was, the, was, was another recent example of that. Uh, they, they are very good at destroying uh, the candidacies, but they're not very good at, uh, at, 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 at succeeding them. Bruce? Isn't it a bit of a confession of desperation that we are looking for somebody to ride in on a horse <laughs> and save us? That's one thought. Whether anybody could have the kind of effect that a Teddy Roosevelt had then, today, given the institutional setting that we've already talked about, the Electoral College and the money in politics and gerrymandering and the rest, uh, that so tilts against one leader taking charge, except rhetorically. And I wonder whether the wind wasn't retrospectively, I'm sure not at the time, the wind was at Teddy Roosevelt's back in a number of senses, and not more in our face today. I'm thinking of the nature of the challenges we face. Global climate change is part to think of a savior for global climate change. A budget that is already busted, and that we have no money, more money to spend to uh, effect the kinds of changes that we think ought to happen in infrastructure and otherwise. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm concerned that we may be hoping, and, and I'm worried that in looking for a savior, you're as likely to get the opposite as you are a savior. Well, we have the, um, you know, we have the great person theory of history that, uh, that, that, uh, 
uh, crisis uh, begets um, uh, leadership. Uh, that in, in moments of, of peril, in moments of uncertainty, in moments of uh, uh, when, when, when we are at sea, um, it, it's not that uh, we sort of wish for the man on horseback to come striding in. It is that, um, that, that, that in, in many historical circumstances, uh, the, the person who turns out to be the rider on horseback emerges. Uh, it's hard to imagine a way out, Bruce, without leadership. Uh, where that leadership might come from, whether it would come in the form of an individual uh, or a set of ideas espoused by a group of individuals. Um, what's, what's lacking at the moment uh, is, is, is I, I think, is a coherent ideology. The, within the Democratic Party, you have a very spirited debate going on between two competing ideologies. And on the Republican side, there is no ideology that is discernible at, at the moment. So, uh, I, 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 I certainly share your sense of gloom, uh, but I don't know what the alternative to uh, emergent leadership in times of crisis is. Uh, I read, a, a Peter Radford put me on to um, a book recently uh, that, that I thought at this point maybe is, is worth mentioning. Um, it is by uh, a, an Aust Austrian economist by the name of Walter Scheidel, and it's called The Great Leveler. And what Scheidel argues is that um, the only time that inequality is ever reversed is in times uh, when the four horsemen uh, appear, uh, okay. uh, the four, an apocalypse occurs. Uh, he says most typically, and certainly in the modern era, uh, uh, almost exclusively, that is war. And he points out that it was uh, World Wars I and II that brought about the great leveling that occurred in income maldistribution uh, after the war and, le and led to this peer comparative period of, uh, of, of shared prosperity that uh, we lived through in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. Um, and. Uh, I think there's, there's something to be said for, for that argument, uh, that uh, it, because, because it's consistent with the broader proposition that it is only in times of, of genuine crisis that real change of any kind uh, occurs. So, you know, is America on the cusp of a crisis of the depth that would give rise to real change? And then what would that look like? Uh, and what direction would it take? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, when, as long as the economy is humming along the way we're told it is now, uh, although there are an awful lot of people in it who don't seem to recognize that they're benefiting uh, from that, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to imagine. Would, would, would international conflict be the place this is likely to happen? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, but. Um, you know, a, 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 another collapse of, of the American stock market uh, leading to widespread uh, economic dislocation, who knows. What I do think is that, as I mentioned in, in my talk, the, the competing of the two populisms of the moment is itself a reflection of something that feels like a crisis, mm -hmm. uh, but um, perhaps not to the extent that it's yet going to produce Cataclysmic change, and I, 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 and you know that that's anybody's guess. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, don't you think maybe we're looking at a different animal from the 1900s? I mean, the population then was 75 million ish. The population now 360 million. There's a whole different mix in the population now than the population of the 19. Don't you think maybe America is just too big to be one nation? Hmm. I knew we were going to have a really good discussion. <laughs> uh, for those of, the, the, of you who didn't hear, he, he said, uh, um, you know, historical comparison can sometimes be taken too far. Uh, 
Uh, and isn't it possible that the America of the early 20th century is so different from the America of the first quarter of the 21st century that comparison is, is not really uh, apt? Uh, or to, to say it as, as, as Michael did, uh, we were 75 million back at the turn of the 20th century, and we are <clears throat> 350, 360 million today. Isn't America just too big to be a single country? Um, I actually don't think so. Uh, I, I take your point about comparison, and that's why I quoted Twain rather than anybody who would say that history repeats itself, because it doesn't. But I mean, what's the purpose of a talk like this if we can't play with historical an analogy and, and, and try to see whether we can distill lessons from our experience that might be applicable to our current circumstances? Um, I, clearly, uh, we are a much larger, much more diverse country, although, you know, one thing I didn't really dwell on, but that is really striking in the parallel, is that the period between 1890 and 1924 was a period of just unbelievable immigration. This country was transformed from an Anglo-Saxon country into a much more polyglot country, although still predominantly European. Uh, what's happened in the period since uh, the 1960s to the current day is that we have again gone through an unbelievable transformation uh, in the complexion of our society, uh, become that much more of a, of a polyglot, uh, multiracial, multiethnic uh, society. And sure, that's very different from the situation that existed in the early part of the 20th century, yet there is a certain parallelism that uh, that, that strikes me. So uh, your question is much too difficult for me to answer. I think, I think in fact, it's too difficult for anybody to answer. Um, but, uh, but I have more confidence, I think, that even at its current size, we could find a way to govern ourselves more effectively than we currently are. Okay, the, the question, I, I don't quite understand what you mean by top-down, but um, instead of taking a top-down view, would I contrast uh, the nature of the nature of social unrest today, pardon? Popular moods. Popular moods. Yeah. Um, well, the 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 one that's that's most striking to me is um, how many people in the late 19th and early 20th century felt as if the industrialization of the country was passing them by and leaving them behind. Uh, the, the, the entire, we were an agrarian economy until very shortly before all of a sudden we were an industrial economy and the people in that agrarian economy who were left behind were desperately unhappy. Uh, I think that's not unlike uh, the people in the post-industrial society who were part of the industrial society and feel as if they've been completely abandoned by the American economic system. Uh, not uh, at all unlike, um, uh, the, the, and, and the immigrants to the cities um, uh, living in, 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 in horrendous circumstances are not unlike, I think, uh, many in the urban underclass in the United States today who feel as if uh, the, the, the rising prosperity of, of the urban elite has left them completely aside and there's there's a, a deep and abiding resentment and and that resentment manifests itself largely on the left in in our contemporary politics and the the resentment of those in the rural areas who feel abandoned and left behind is largely manifested on what we think of today as right-wing populism but I think that I think there there are really quite strong similarities it, they they both arise from a sense that the economic dislocations uh, favor some groups uh, and a relatively small proportion of the population at the very top, leaving a vast majority of people uh, down below behind. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, much of Trump's support comes from people who really feel as if the urban elites have left them behind. It's an anti-elitist uh, populism uh, that I think is very comparable with the prairie populism of the of the 1890s and, and 1910s. Um, well, her first, first was a comment, which is that uh, the looming 
apocalypse is uh, climate change. And, um, and, I, and, and I'm glad you, you did say that, because when we think about the crisis that could, in fact, uh, bring about uh, really transformative change, uh, it's not upon us at the moment, but we certainly have every reason to believe that it's coming. And, uh, and, and, and you, you, you may be, you, you may be uh, quite right about that. You're not alone in, in your view that, that's, that that may be the stimulus. The question was, um, I, I had mentioned that Roosevelt was a racist and a bigot, um, and uh, that uh, in that respect, he, uh, he, sh he shares a, a, a characteristic with the uh, present incumbent. And um, how come Roosevelt was able to unify the country, uh, whereas uh, the incumbent of the moment seems to be using racism to divide us? Uh, I guess that my, my answer is that Roosevelt was a product of his, uh, of his time, of his class, uh, of, of his society. That, you know, Roosevelt was a racist when practically all white Americans were racists uh, of one kind or another. I mean, race, racism, Jim Crow, the Jim Crow era was, was at, its, at its height uh, in, in that period of time. So that, uh, and, and he didn't actively espouse his racial views. He just didn't do anything uh, to help black people. But let me come back and just say one thing, because I thought I heard you say that he was arrogant, he was aggressive, and did I hear the word degenerate? I mean, no, I did not say, I did not say degenerate. No, and n nor, nor would I. Uh, no, no, I, he's, you know, he, he, he had an outgoing, ebullient uh, personality that he directed toward constructive change. And that's the difference. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to make a comparison and, and give you some food for thought for that comparison. It has to do with the conservative agenda currently, right, being largely anti-science, anti-rationality, anti-theory, right? And I wonder what the climate at the turn of the 20th century was like, as, as you know, to be with respect to those things, and how that might affect progressivism's ability to make an impact. Now that's a really, I, I, th that's a very interesting observation, because the progressives thought of themselves as being hyper-scientific. Uh, they were deeply committed to science. Uh, and in fact, some of the great institutions of science uh, today in the United States were the product of uh, progressive thinking. Uh, sometimes it turned weird, like eugenics, uh, but it was that, that was a, a, a science, that was, was trying to be a science. The social sciences were created by the progressives. Um, so, uh, there couldn't be more of a contrast between the, uh, the attitude of um, intellectual leaders in the United States at the time of the progressive movement vis-a-vis -vis science and scientific inquiry and application of the scientific method and today's anti-science uh, that at least permeates the, the thinking of, of one party uh, than that, it's it's a, it, it's a striking contrast, and and to me it's uh, it, it's it, it's both. Um, I mean, the attack on science and the attack on rationality, the attack on evidence uh, that goes on today in the in the in the service of a of a, of, of some kind of ideology, but really only in the service of of, of, of vested interests, economic interests. Um, is, is to me one of the most disturbing things about contemporary America. I mean, if we lose our faith in science and inquiry and progress through science, then I think we're doomed uh, as, as a culture, and, 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 I, and I worry deeply about that. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. <laughs>